We're about ready for Book of Ruth, aren't we? Ruth is a small book of four chapters that in our Bible comes after Judges, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's in the writings under what is called the roll or Megillot. Actually, it's in the third part of the Hebrew Scripture. And Megillot means roll. There are five books on the roll. That's when we uh, get that far along, we'll be mentioning it again. But uh, there's Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Ruth, Lamentations, and uh, one other. And the reason they're called the roll, or the megillot, which means roll, is because they were on one scroll, literally a scroll. Now, why did the English Bible put it where it's located after the period of Judges, or the book of Judges, is because the book chronologically, historically, goes there. As you will notice from verse 1, it came to pass in the days when the Judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So the reason we place it there is because of verse 1 of the book of Ruth. Or the reason the English versions placed it there. Actually, the English version doesn't follow the correct chronological order, so there's no particular reason to think that they were accurate in putting it in any particular place because other books are not in chronological order. They've got chronicles after kings, uh, for example, in First and Second Chronicles were the last books to be written in the Old Testament. Some believe it's about the time of Gideon because chapter 1 of Ruth, if you compare that with Judges 6, you see that during the period of Gideon there was a famine, scarcity of food, and so since the book dates itself in the period of Judges, that seems to be a logical place to put it. And another reason that they place it during Gideon's period is because the genealogy in chapter 4 shows that uh, Obed, who is the son of uh, Ruth and Boaz, Obed, if you trace back uh, the dates, the periods of the people mentioned there in the genealogy in verse 22 of chapter 4, you get a period about the date of Gideon. And so probably the period mentioned here is during the Great Famine, during the period when the judges ruled, probably Gideon. Now the twofold purpose of the book, the basic purpose is to establish the Messianic family, Messianic line. The basic purpose of the book is to establish the messianic family in Israel because here we have the beginning of it Obad begat Jesse Jesse begat David another purpose of the book it gives us a contrast of the religious apostasy of this period which is the book of Judges with the faithful remnant that was obviously in Israel during this period which is the book of Ruth. Of course, the whole book of Judges is one cycle after another, as we showed you when we studied that, surveyed that, of sin and apostasy, and God would raise up a deliverer who would then rule and judge them till his death. And they would go back into sin again. So the book of Judges shows the apostasy of Israel in the book of Ruth, which uh, takes place during the same period, shows that there was a faithful remnant of whom Boaz, of course, is the example. God has always had his people, even in the midst of apostasy, who were faithful. Now, as to the authorship of the book, the author is unknown. Probably Samuel wrote it but there's no way to really know. 
As far as the time of its writing, we're not talking about the time of the book. That's during the period of Judges. We know that. But as to the time of the writing, it was probably during the period of Samuel. That's why tradition says he probably wrote it. In favor of the period of Samuel is to be seen in the fact that verse 1 of Ruth shows that the age, the period of the Judges is past. So we know that. We know the dates of these events. He says the date of the judges is, period of the judges is past, and then according to the genealogy in chapter 4, it stops with David. So if the book had been written after David, certainly it would have listed David's descendants, like Solomon at least. Now, of course, you couldn't prove anything by that. It could be still be written after David and they're establishing the Messianic line and just simply stop with David because they're wanting to show where David came from. But uh, in all probability, since verse 1 shows the period of the judges is past and David is the last named in chapter 4, that would put the book in the period of Samuel between Judges and David would be Samuel, exactly where it occurs in history. Well, those things won't be important in eternity, but they'll be important now to help you understand the book. Now, the book is simple, and we won't uh, spend a lot of time on it. I've got a four-point outline according to the four chapters. First of all, Naomi's sojourn in Moab and return to Bethlehem, chapter 1. That's Naomi's sojourn in Moab and her return to Bethlehem in chapter 1. Now, according to chapter 1, we, as you know from your reading, we had a famine, severe famine in Bethlehem, or right in, in Judah. And a man from Bethlehem, Judah, named Elimelech, his wife Naomi had two sons, Machlon and Kilion, again, not a good translation of their names. In English, it's Mal, Malon or something. But in Hebrew, it's Machlon and Kilion. Naomi, Elimelech, and two sons went down to Moab. And uh, there the two sons die. By the way, the two sons marry first before they die. One marries a Moabitess named Orpah, and the other, Ruth. Two sons and husband die. And by the way, the Moabites are descendants of Lot, so this would be indirectly related to the Jews because Lot was Abraham's nephew. But uh, they weren't, weren't supposed to marry outside their family, but remember we're in the period of Judges, and while they're not supposed to marry outside the family of Israel, sometimes they did it. And Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem. She lost her husband, two sons, and Ruth and Orpah start back with her, but Orpah is persuaded to go back to her people. But in verse 16, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. Of course, this is quite a well-known expression of faithfulness. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Now remember that uh, she doesn't know their God yet. Or she may have learned of him, but the point is, Moabites were not worshippers of Yahweh. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Then chapter 2, Ruth gleans in the field of Boaz. Now this very simple story that you've read many times, or at least enough to know the, what it is, so we move on chapter 3, Ruth's appeal to Boaz in chapter 3. And the appeal to Boaz is to fulfill his responsibility as a near kinsman, or as a kinsman, which under what is called Leveret Law in the Old Testament, that's Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. The Leveret Law required that a brother, if there was one, or 
the next of kin, if a woman's husband died leaving no sons, then the, the brother of the dead husband or the next of kin was to marry her. That it, he may already have a wife, but he was to take her as wife and raise up seed for the, his dead brother's name so that he would not lose his inheritance in Israel. And then she would cease to be his wife and uh, the sons would care for her after they're grown if she was still living. That's Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. It's called uh, Leveret Law, the law of the responsibility of the brother to a dead brother. That's also set forth in Matthew 22, verses 23 to 33, because there the Sadducees raise the question about this law. That's the account where a woman's husband kept dying, seven brothers married her, and whose wife would she be in the resurrection, remember? But that's a reference to this law in chapter 3. And of course, Boaz has the responsibility, but as you know from reading the account, he said there's someone nearer than I am, a nearer kinsman. And he gets first choice. And the nearer kinsman was willing to do it because he would get all the property that belonged to Elimelech, who had died, and the sons. But when he discovered he had to marry Ruth with it and raise up seed to her, then he wouldn't get the property, you see. Besides that, she was a Moabitess, and that would mar his inheritance, as he said. And so as a result of that, then Boaz said, if he won't perform the duty of a kinsman, then I will. And that's the story behind this unfamiliar transaction here to us living down 2000 A.D., that uh, it was quite proper in Israel for this to happen. She goes to him and makes a proposal, which is... So he performs his duty, chapter 4. We have Ruth's marriage to Boaz and the beginning of the Messianic family. And that's the truth about Ruth. That's all there is, unless you've got a question or two. Very simple story, beautiful story. It's read by the Jews at Pentecost because it depicts the harvest, and Pentecost is, of course, the harvest feast in Israel. Yeah. How would, how would, would it be that the uh, Jews and the Hebrews would decide to include a book like this in their canon? How do they decide on that? Well, we discussed that when we discussed the, the canon of Scripture. I, I answered those questions, and it, it'll be back there in your notes. It would just take too long to get into it again, okay. you see. Because if I say one thing, I've got to say another to support that. It's not that simple. That's why we studied the canon of Scripture. But remember, we summed it all up by saying that we, of course, as Israel, believe the Holy Spirit. We take that by faith, guided in the selection of what books went into the canon. They had to meet certain tests. They had to be written in Hebrew. They had to have an extant copy, that is, a copy in their hands at the time the canon was put together. It had to exist in Hebrew. Some books in the Apocrypha were not in Hebrew. That some said, let's include like First and Second Mac Maccabees, but no books were admitted to the canon except written in Hebrew. And so there are a lot of tests like that. <coughs> Well, of course, customs have escaped, uh, have long since uh, fallen into disuse that we don't always know the meaning, but the obvious meaning here is that uh, the men wore long robes too, and, and your robe, as the Old Testament and New Testament shows, like blind Bartimaeus had his robe, that's your most valuable possession. As far as an article of clothing, it was your bed at night, and kept you from the sun or the cold in the daytime. So she simply lay at his feet and asked him to cover her, which would be symbolic of the fact he was accepting her request to redeem her, to redeem Elimelech's inheritance. In the process, he had to marry her. When the living brother married the dead brother's wife, he didn't get anything. He just was out the money. So this next of kin wasn't too anxious to do that. He was willing to do it in chapter 4 until he found out that there was a wife went along with it. And then he wouldn't get anything. He would have to raise up sons to her, then the sons would get the inheritance because it had to stay in that name. 
See, no one was to ever lose their inheritance in Israel. And that's the way God kept it from happening. If there was no brother, then it would be the next male of kin. And there was one closer to Boaz. But uh, she was interested in Boaz, and so was God. That was the Messianic line. But that's what that signifies, just an old custom that signifies he was going to cover her and protect her, redeem her property. All right, let's come to books of Samuel. So I've said before, this uh, course is really about four days a week when we taught it before and when you take it in the seminary or Christian college survey is four days a week. And we've been several months and just now getting into Samuel. One day a week you can't cover too much. So there are things we have to skip covering it just one day a week and trust that you'll get it out of your reading. First and second Samuel. In the Hebrew, it's Shemueu. Shemueu, which Eel is always a name for God. And it means asked of God, if I remember correctly. All Hebrew names mean something. It says S-H-E-M-U-E-L in Hebrew. It's not that in English. The English translators, when they made up names, I still don't know where they got the names. S-H shorty M-U long E-L. Shemuel. Ends up being Samuel. That's pretty close. Some of them are way off. Moses is Mashiach. No, Moshe, Moshe. Moshe, Mashiach is Messiah. Moshe. See how close that is to Moses. That's not even close. Jacob is way off. Jacob. Jacob. And Jehovah and Yahweh are not even closely related. Jehovah. Of course, they took two words to make that. That's a word man has invented, as we've told you. All right, Samuel. Two books named for Samuel. First of all, because he's the principal character in the first book, and he anointed Saul and David, who were the principal characters in the second book. There's no justification for calling 2 Samuel 2 Samuel. Remember, the titles to books are not in the inspired text. They were added. The Hebrew doesn't call the books what we call them, like Genesis is a name invented long after Genesis was written. The Hebrews generally took the first word or words of a book, like Genesis is bed or sheath, in the beginning. So the Hebrew Bible calls Genesis in the beginning and Exodus, and these are the names, and so forth. There's no reason to call Second Samuel Samuel because Samuel dies in 1 Samuel 25. So obviously he didn't write Second Samuel and doesn't appear in it. And originally, in the Hebrew Bible, you had 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Kings. And that's what 1st, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings were. Originally, Samuel and Kings were four books. One, two, three, four kings. Because you have the origin of the kingship quite early in the book of Samuel, you see, First Samuel. So they're really dealing with the origin of the kingship and the history. Well, who wrote First and Second Samuel? Samuel probably wrote up through chapter 24, which is his period. He could well have written it, no doubt did. At least he collected the material that the inspired scribes would use. David's death is not recorded in 2 Samuel. It isn't recorded over till 1 Kings. So it's probable that the books, 1 and 2 Samuel, were written before David's death, or it would be recorded in 2 Samuel. So whoever wrote it, wrote it between the birth of Samuel and the death of David. Now we can't get any closer than some of the statements like that because if anyone knew who wrote these things, the Jews would and they, they don't know. But perhaps some of the prophets, there were a number of prophets 
as well as inspired historians, but the prophets were historians, and we see in 1 Chronicles 29, 29, that Nathan and Gad wrote books. And God didn't preserve all the books that were written because he didn't intend they should all be scripture, but prophets wrote books that we don't have a record of today. 1 Chronicles 29, 29, now these are the acts of David the king, first and last. Behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, and in the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer. So there are three books, and we only have one of the three preserved, which is Samuel, first and second Samuel. The acts of David are written in the books of Samuel, the book of the prophet Gad, the book of the prophet Nathan. So probably Nathan or Gad wrote the books of Samuel because they were inspired historians, as you see from 1 Chronicles 29, 29. David could have written it, so you have to include him. Now when we say David wrote it, it wouldn't necessarily mean that he sat down and wrote it with a pen because being king he would have scribes and so forth and he could dictate it and tell them to gather the historical records because Samuel and Kings is... The books are filled with historical records. The purpose of these books. The books of Samuel record the establishment of the monarchy. See, Samuel is the connecting link between the rule of the judges and the kingship. He's the last of the judges. Samuel is the last judge technically isn't because he appoints his two sons to be judges, but they're not included, not counted by the Hebrews as true judges because they were unregenerate. Did you know Samuel had two unregenerate sons? Yeah, just because a person is in the Bible doesn't mean that they're all their children were saved. David's favorite son, Absalom, was uh, a usurper, tried to usurp the throne. So Samuel comes between judges and kings. Spiritually, the book shows in Saul's kingship the failure of trusting in an earthly monarch, whereas David serves to illustrate the type of an ideal king which God will provide, Christ himself. Of course, David all through the Bible is a type of Christ. Third purpose, Samuel and Kings form a continuous history depicting the rise and fall of Israel, rise and fall of the nation of Israel. You can fit all the books of the prophets in these periods, not all of them, but most of them. You've got some after the exile and some during the exile. Most of your prophets you could just sandwich in to the books of Kings. That's why we told you to get one of the charts. You should have two of them. That gives the Old Testament patriarchs and judges. Then the other one would depict the kings. And you see, whenever a prophet prophesied on the chart, he will be fit into the period of that king. And uh, it's too complicated to try to keep in mind, for most people at least, so that's why you need the chart. But what we're saying is Samuel and Kings is the Old Testament. Anything, most everything else, you just sandwich right in to those four books where they belong. Like in the book of Acts, you can sandwich most of Paul's epistles right into the book of Acts. Because that's when he wrote them, during the period of the book of Acts, for the most part. The religious teachings of the book... Well, just one, really, that true religion is not outward form, but an attitude of the heart which results in spiritual obedience, or results in obedience to the will of God. True religion is not outward form, but it's an attitude of the heart which results in obedience to the will of God. I'll give you 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 16, verse 7, which illustrates that fact. After Saul 
disobeys God and offers sacrifice of cattle and so forth that he took contrary to the will of God from the enemy and offered sacrifices to God. God said, destroy everything. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In other words, which would God rather have you do, Saul? Obey him or offer him sacrifices? See, God ordained sacrifices. But which would he rather have, the sacrifice or obedience, is what he said. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is sorcery, God said, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. And he was worshiping the Lord with his sacrifices while God, in the process of worship, God rejected him being king. They're all put in the Bible to teach us, Paul says, twice lessons so we don't commit the same mistakes. Now, Paul wouldn't have said that in the New Testament if because you're under grace, you could disobey God and still be accepted of God. No, you can't. Right in the midst of worshiping God, God said, I reject you as king because you disobeyed me. So the lessons are there. And I know what the old churches teach, you know, but uh, let's stay with the word. Yeah. Paul said, these are written for our admonition. 1 Corinthians 10, lest we make the same mistakes and are rejected also. Romans 11 says the same thing. Then verse 7, here's where he sends Samuel to anoint a king in Saul's place. And God looks at the heart, verse 7, and not the outward man, which teaches the same principle. The Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, speaking of one of Jesse's sons. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So that's teaching the same principle that True religion is not outward appearance or form, but the attitude of the heart, which results in obedience to God. 1 Samuel 15, 22, 16, verse 7. Now, there are a lot of spiritual lessons you could draw from the book, but essentially that's, that's the lesson, because uh, over and over, You've heard that text referred to and preached on. Hath God as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken in the fat of rams. All right, I've divided the book into three sections. I'll give you the three major outlines first, and then uh, we'll look at it briefly, survey the book. We have the life of Samuel, chapters 1 to 7. The life of Saul, chapters 8 to 15. And the life of David, chapters 16 to 31. Very simple. Now, the, their lives overlap, of course, but these sections I've given you is where one personality predominates. Samuel, then Saul, then David, in that, in that order. All right, first of all, Samuel's birth and youth, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 11. Now here we have the case of um, a man with two wives, Alcana, had two wives, one named Hannah, the other Penina. And I'm not trying to be facetious to say everybody from Sunday school should know about the birth of Samuel. So we won't spend a lot of time telling what you already know. Hannah was barren, and her, the other wife, Elkanah, had two wives, mocked her because of it, and she was grieved. And so they went up yearly to offer sacrifice, as the Jews were required to do. And she went to the temple to pray. In verse 11, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid 
and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor upon his head, which means that he was going to be a Nazarite. Who was a Nazarite we just studied about? Samson, yes. Where the hair isn't cut, drinks no wine, touches no dead body, the Nazarite. So he'd be holy, and Eli, the priest, who has two unregenerate sons, who were priests, Hophni and Phinehas, sees her praying, but she isn't speaking audibly, which shows that the Jews prayed out loud. Most of your churches today, when they'd hear us praying out loud, they think it's confusion, but that's the way the Jews prayed, out loud. Because she was praying silently, and just her lips moved, he thought she was drunk, and told her to... Um, not be so wicked. Eli said, How long will you be drunken? Put away the wine from thee. Verse 14. And she says she wasn't drunken, but she was weaving back and forth, probably on her knees, praying because of the sorrow of her heart. So she tells him she's praying for a son. Verse 17. Eli, as the high priest says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Well, Eli wasn't the best example of what a father and priest ought to be, but when they stand in the place of divinely appointed authority, they can often prophesy and speak things that will come to pass. Many examples of that in Scripture, and that's what happened. He said, the Lord grant you your petition, and she got it. came to pass, verse 20, that she conceived and called his name Samuel. She said, because I ask of the Lord. That's what his name means, to ask of the Lord, Shemuel. So they kept going up uh, to offer sacrifice. Next year they start up again. Hannah asked to stay there. She says in verse 22, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. She's going to give him to the priesthood. Or that is to Eli. And the Jews, according to the book of Maccabees, weaned their children at three years. So she's not giving Eli a baby. She's going to give him at least a three-year-old child, maybe five. So she did that. Verse 24, when she weaned him, she went up. And verse 26, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he should be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So that is quite a dedication, where she gives up her only child. She was barren, didn't have any, then kept her vow to the Lord. Now in chapter 2, the most important aspect here is not so evident unless you're trained in the Old Testament uh, genealogies and all, but what we have here is a prediction of the transfer of the priesthood from one line, from Eli's line to Zadok's line. The priesthood is going to come through Zadok later, and that happens later on. There's a transfer made under the reign of Solomon because Aaron had different sons and the priesthood would descend, the high priesthood we're talking about, not the Levites. The priests came out of the tribe of Levi, and not all Levites were priests, but, but we're talking about the high priest family came directly from Aaron. And because Eli is not faithful as he should be in his priesthood, God predicts here, verse 22 and following, that he's going to take the priesthood from Eli verse 12, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord, which is the technical phrase in the Old Testament to be unregenerate. See, some people try to teach that the Old Testament saints were unregenerate, which is ridiculous. See, they're, it's just again because people don't know the word, they don't know the Hebrew figures of speech and technical terms. Like a man of God in the Old Testament is a prophet. Well, if you didn't know that, then every time you read man of God, you wouldn't know he's talking about a prophet. And so, like in Psalm 1, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, you see. And so when you use know, you're talking about an in intimate, saving, personal knowledge. So they knew not the Lord. They knew the Lord. They were priests. 
but they didn't know him savingly. They were unregenerate. Well, we'll get into more of that in theology, that the Old Testament does show they were regenerate. How could you have anybody saved that's unregenerate to begin with? Looks like they'd think of that. Then down in verse 22 shows how wicked they were. Well, the whole, the whole passage shows that they would come and take parts of the sacrifice that belonged to God. The fat had to be burned on the altar, and they would come and get their part, the unauthorized part of the sacrifice, before they offered it. And uh, that's what's told here. Then down in verse 22, to show how utterly wicked they were, when Eli was old, he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. Not only did they steal sacrifice, parts that they weren't supposed to have, but they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they were really something to be representing the priesthood of God. And so in verse 27, you have a man of God who is a prophet come to Eli, and there we have a prophecy concerning the transfer of the high priesthood from the family of Eli to Zadok. The priest will be a Zadokian priest. And all of Eli's family will be cut off. Verse 34, this shall be a sign unto thee, says the prophet, <clears throat> that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up, and here's the prophecy, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Now that goes beyond just talking about Zadok and his house. First Kings 2.27 is where the transfer actually comes. And the priesthood goes into the family of Zadok. Yes? Eli and Zadok are both descendants of Aaron. But see, different families would have the high priesthood. And it was coming through, it was coming directly from Aaron, Eliezer, on down to Eli. But because he was unfaithful, then God is here predicting the transfer. He doesn't mention Zadok here, he's mentioned in other passages, that he's going to transfer it to Zadok. Then Samuel's call, chapter 3. The word of the Lord is quite significant. Chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Remember, we're in the period of judges. Samuel's the last judge. He will be the last judge. The word of the Lord was precious. You didn't hear it much. Well, all you have to do is read the book of Judges and you see that. There was no open vision. No visions or no revelation was coming. So the Lord called Samuel. And here was the first word of the Lord coming for a long time. Verse 4. And again, you know the story how he called him three times. He thought it was Eli, the priest. And Eli finally saw what was happening. He said, it isn't me calling you, it's the Lord next time answering. So he did, and then the Lord gave him a prophecy concerning Eli of the fall of his house. And Eli called Samuel, verse 16. He said, what is the thing the Lord has shown me? He says, don't hide anything from me. So Samuel told him all of the preceding verses, what happened. How he's going to remove the priesthood of Eli. Verse 19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And he let none of his words fall to the ground, which again is a Hebrew technical expression, which means that whatever Samuel prophesied or said came to pass. He let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Why? Because his prophecies came to pass. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Now that's where the tabernacle is. You see, you don't have a temple in Israel until the time of Solomon. He builds a temple. That's quite a bit later. The tabernacle they had with them, they built at Mount Sinai, and they had with them for the 40 years in the wilderness. It's set up at Shiloh. So he appeared in Shiloh. That's where Samuel and Eli were at the 
tabernacle. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So the Lord is revealing himself to Samuel. So Samuel's just a lad here, probably five years old or so, serving the Lord all of his life from the beginning. Chapters 4 to 7, we have the Philistine defeat of Israel and the capture of the ark. Chapters 4 to 7, the Philistines defeat Israel, capture the ark. Remember, we're in the period of Judges, and the Philistines are one of their enemies, as we saw during the period of the Judges. The Philistines defeat Israel, so Israel comes back, verse 3, and gets the ark of the covenant. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant and take that into battle. They think, you know, it's going to work like a magical charm. And all that happens is they lose the ark. Because God isn't going to bless disobedience and sin. And significant in verse 4, as I've told you before, this Old Testament teaches that the temple was God's palace. The Holy of Holies, his throne room, the Ark of the Covenant was his throne. He literally sat there. That's what the Old Testament teaches. Doesn't mean he wasn't present everywhere else at the same time, but he manifested his presence there. And Moses talked to him face to face, we're told. And verse 4 says, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, the Lord of Hosts which dwells between the cherubim. There it is again, you see. He dwells there. He was literally there. And Ezekiel, as I told you before, shows his glory departing. And then it returns during the millennium. Someone had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask you just about that, how they were able to go get the ark and as you didn't carry it out because if anyone even came to the present. Well, they had staves that they put through rings on the ark. Well, I know, but I mean, how did they come to the presence of it because the Lord's glory had departed from it? From the ark? No, not yet. See, they say he dwells there. and didn't depart until the fall of Jerusalem, just before the fall. Ezekiel sees it. Ezekiel's already been captured. There were three conquests of Jerusalem in the fall. There were three times that Nebuchadnezzar took captives. And in the first lot, he took Ezekiel and Daniel. And Ezekiel has a vision while he's over in Babylon before... Jerusalem has fallen finally, totally, for the third time of its conquest. He has a vision of the glory of the Lord departing. See, he's, it's there. You come to the Holy of Holies, only the high priest was allowed in there before the ark. Yeah, well, Eli is the high priest, and, uh, well, it doesn't say anything about God striking them dead uh, if they did, because obviously he didn't. You know, there's, there's no rule you can set up and say God has to do everything a certain way. Uh, later on, when they bring the ark back, they look in the ark at Beth Shemesh, and uh, I think 50,000 are stricken with a plague because of it. But then you can spend time explaining why that, that would make sense, because now they're bringing the ark back and they're not treating it with respect. And God intends for it to happen this way because he's going to destroy Hophni and Phinehas like he predicted. Well, anyway, they capture the ark, and uh, all through uh, the Philistine cities, plagues break out because the ark of the Lord is there. And uh, Eli gets words that his two sons have been killed. The ark of the Lord, verse 11, chapter 4, was taken. Two sons were slain. Verse 18, the messenger comes and tells Eli, it came to pass when they made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and break his neck, and there he died. He was an old man and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. See, he's a judge. Then Samuel will be the last judge. And his daughter-in-law finished his wife when she heard that her husband had been killed. Verse 21, she called the name of the son that was born Ichabod, saying, what it means in Hebrew, the glory is departed, Ichabod. And then chapter 5 and 6 and um, 7, you see how the Philistines, when they took the ark, God began to send plagues and judgment against them. They put the ark of God in their temple. Verse 2 of chapter 5, the house of Dagon. 
Dog in Hebrew, those of you studying Hebrew know, is fish. So their God was a fish god. They worshiped the image of a fish. So they put the ark in the temple of Dagon. Verse 3, when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon had fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. They put the ark before their God, and their God had fallen on his face. So they set him back up again. <laughs> and when they arose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. And only the stump of Dagon was left to him. <clears throat> Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So if you want to know where the custom comes from carrying brides over thresholds <laughs> and not stepping on thresholds, You'd be surprised how many people will never step on it. They don't know why, but it's that old occult spirit at work. Not step on the lines of a sidewalk. Well, here's the source of it. So those of you getting ready to get married, you won't be following any Christian practice by any means to carry your bride over the threshold. Just refrain. You may have to repent of that and get some occult deliverance. <laughs> Because that just any of these heathen practices open the door to oppression. So many people, I say to them, oh, I've never been involved in our cult. Well, ask some of them, did you carry your bride over the threshold? <laughs> if the circumstances were right, they could get oppressed. Yes, they could. Uh, ignorance of what you're doing doesn't preserve you from oppression. That's right. Well, some can laugh at it if they want. It doesn't matter to me because I'm the one who has to deal with the people that need deliverance. And I've found things that others laugh about, like having a wart removed, and I have them deal with that as an occult contact with the powers of darkness. And they get rid of their oppression, then let people laugh if I'm helping people. But there's where the practice starts, you see it. Because the heathen god fell on the threshold and he got his head and hands cut off. Well, and then the ark goes, they get rid of the ark, send it to other Philistine cities and everywhere it goes, uh, plagues break out and finally they put it on a cart and send it back to Israel. <laughs> Glad enough to get rid of the throne of God. Which is what it is, the throne of God. Now God wasn't on it while it was down in Philistine territory, but he's the one causing the plagues, of course people at Beth Shemesh, of course, as we've already said, because they looked in the ark, he smote 50,000 of them. Now the critics like to say Beth Shemesh was just a small town and there couldn't have been 50,000 inhabitants in the town, but that isn't the point. The men of Beth Shemesh looked in the ark and as a result of that, God smote 50,000 Israelites. This is all it's saying. But anyway, and there's no way to look back and know how many were there in that town at that time anyway. Life of Saul, chapters 8 to 15. Israel demands a king. Chapter 8. Came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his two sons judges. So as I say, we've got two other judges after Samuel, but they're never counted really as judges because they were unregenerate. The name of the firstborn was Joel second Abiah. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after money, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Which means he was king, as we've been telling him. In fact, the scriptures say that he was king over Israel, and that was his throne, the ark. 
being invisible, they didn't see him, but he was there. Well, so God lets them have a king, as you know, and then Samuel in the rest of chapter 8 tells them what kind of a king he'll be. He will oppress them with taxes, take the bust of their children as servants and slaves and young men for the army and so forth. So God allows him to have a king. Chapter 9 through 11, you have the anointing and kingdom of Saul. The anointing of Saul as king and his kingdom. 9 to 11. Speaks of a man of the tribe of Benjamin called Kish, and he had a son whose name was Saul. And here's the way people choose men. He was a choice young man, goodly, there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. That means appearance. For his shoulders and upward, from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. A very handsome, strong figure that stood probably almost seven foot tall. A big man. Well, it says from his shoulders and upwards, he was higher than anybody. And God was showing them that they could select the best of their stock. And remember, the Benjamites were quite skilled warriors. Remember, they were the left-handed men that could hit a hare and never miss with a sling stone. So God was going to show them they could select the best man, and he would still not be God's man. Saul lost his asses. Again, you know the story. They went to Samuel, who was a prophet. Verse 9, before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spake, come, let us go to the seer. He's called a seer. He's now, now that he that's called a prophet was before time called a seer. He was called that because he saw visions. Samuel tells him where his asses are with a word of knowledge. Verse 15, for the Lord had spoken in Samuel's ear, saying, before Saul came tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come up unto me. Still in the period of Judges, you see. And that's the same thing you heard all through the book of Judges, you see. Their cries come up, so God appoints them a deliverer. Up through Samuel, he's called a judge. Now he's going to be a king. So he anoints Saul. The Spirit of the Lord comes on Saul. He prophesies. That's chapters 9 to 11, the beginning of Saul's kingship. Samuel's farewell address in chapter 12. See, they've rejected God. They've rejected Samuel. They want him a king so they can be like the other nations. We could preach a sermon on that. These are religious people, see, wanting to be like the world. That's just the way the church is of our day. Pentecostals, for example, couldn't trust the Holy Spirit to be their leaders. They had to organize so they could be like the other churches in the city, so they lost their power and anointing. It's just the way it is. And so that's what they're doing now in the charismatic movement. They're organizing it with their own hierarchy and it's killing the power of the Spirit. Well, Branham prophesied that years ago. He said, when you organize, you're dead. You ought to read his farewell address if you haven't. Verse 16, Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. He just got finished telling them about their disobedience and how he's been faithful. Verse 17, Is it not wheat harvest today? Well, I will call unto the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you've done in the sight of the Lord in asking for a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask for a king. 
They're always repenting, but they never seem to be able to get to the place where they walk in obedience. God is showing them they need more than a law, more than an earthly king. They need a savior. All through their history, he's showing Israel that. Well, it wasn't a little rainstorm. Nothing weird like you've ever seen. Whatever it was frightened them to death. They said, pray that we don't die. I imagine it was a typhoon, hurricane, and quite a storm all tied up in one. All right. Then in chapters 13 and 14, we have Saul's wars against the Philistines. Saul is quite a warrior. His wars against the Philistines. Chapter 15 is his disobedience and rejection by God as king. No second chance. That was it. People want a king? All right. Here's a king. If he disobeys, then God rejects him. So Samuel told him that the Lord wanted him to go against the Amalekites. Verse 2, you remember what Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came out of Egypt. You see, the Amalekites were the first to attack Israel when they came out of Egypt. They were not yet trained as warriors and had done no fighting. They were just had come out of slavery. So God said, because of that, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Well, Saul slew everybody, but he saved King Agag alive. Verse 8, he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and oxen and so forth and destroyed the rest. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. It repenteth me is not what God said. <laughs> God doesn't repent, Numbers 23, 19. Poor translation. Anyway, we'll read it like it is here, but God doesn't repent. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And he grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And so he goes to Saul the next morning. And Saul says, Well, I've done all the Lord commanded me. Verse 14, Samuel says, And what meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? He said, If you destroyed everything, what's this I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people. Notice who did it? It wasn't Saul. The people spared the best of the sheep. <laughs> so Samuel said, Stay, and I'll tell you what the Lord has said. He says, When you were little in your own eyes, wast thou not made head of all the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? In verse 21, Saul again says the people did it, but the people took of the spoil. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is a sin of sorcery, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Saul said, I've sinned. He finally admits it. Therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Samuel turned about to go away. He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will neither lie nor repent. See there? And we just read where it repented the Lord. So they're not even consistent in their translations, are they? No, the word is shuv, and it means to turn, or turn about. So he anointed, had Saul anointed as king, and when he disobeyed, he turned from his decision to make him king to his decision not to make him king. It means to turn. He doesn't repent, as we see here, and many other passages. We come to the life of David. David in chapter 16 is anointed king. God says 
How long will you mourn for Saul? I have rejected him from being king. I will send it to Jesse up in Bethlehem. And there Jesse parades all of his sons before Samuel. Samuel doesn't yet know who's selected. And each time God would say, he's not the one. This is not he. He said, you're looking on the outward man. Because every time Samuel would look at one of Jesse's sons, oh, surely that would be the one. In verse 7, remember we just read, don't look at his countenance or the height of his stature. He says, I've refused him. And God refused them all. Samuel finally said, don't you have somebody else here? He said, there must be another one because God sent me here. Well, he said, there's a little teenager out there keeping sheep called David. Well, he said, go bring him. And as soon as he brought him, the Lord said, verse 12, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Chapter 17 is David's encounter with Goliath, who stood, verse uh, 4, his height was six cubits and a span. A cubit is 18 inches. So it would be nine and a half feet. Span is about six or eight inches. So it's a huge creature with a helmet of brass on his head, armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs, a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one went before him bearing a shield. He came out and challenged any champion of Israel, said, whoever wins and that nation will dominate the other. And the story, of course, you know that they were all afraid of Goliath. And little David comes up and said, who is he that defies the armies of Israel, the armies of the Lord? David spake, verse 26, says, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine, takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> well, his brother said, David, that's just that youthful zeal, zeal without knowledge. You go back home, verse 28. <laughs> but word reached Saul that there was somebody who would fight Goliath, and he saw he was a child. Youth, verse 33. But he was willing for anybody to try. So he gave him his armor, and David rattled around in it. So David took the armor back off, said, I've not proven it. I'll go out. Don't need anybody but God. And when the Philistine looked, verse 42, and saw it was David, but a youth, ruddy, and a fair countenance. He wasn't even shaving yet, you see. <laughs> Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? See, all he had was his slingshot. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and with spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from off thee, and I'll give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly will know the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When the Philistine heard that, he arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David hasted and ran. Toward. <laughs> the Philistine. So when the devil takes one step toward you, you take two toward him. You, that way you take the initiative away from him. And so David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead. He fell upon his face to the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with sling and stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine. See, he's a hulk of a man. And took his sword, which would take both hands to even pick up, and drew it out of the sheaf and slew him and cut off his head. 
And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines, and we're told they defeated them. So David brings a head to Saul and takes the armor and puts in his own tent, Goliath's armor. That's his trophy. Well, see, he's anointed to be king. Saul doesn't know that yet. And then when the women began to sing songs like they did, when uh, Saul appoints David to be captain over his armies, just a teenager, but he appoints him. Well, after all, it doesn't matter how old you are if you can do the job. And so the women begin to sing in verse 7 songs like this. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul wasn't exactly pleased. <laughs> he was very wroth and said, the saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed unto David ten thousands. To me, they've only ascribed thousands. What can he have more but my kingdom? And so Saul eyed David from that day forward. That means more than just looking at him. As we see in verse 10, an evil spirit from God came upon Saul and and Saul tried to kill David. And so then we have David's flight from Saul, chapters 18 to 20. He spends a good deal of time running. And then we have David's wanderings. He finally gets to the place where he just has to leave Saul altogether. He's no longer his general. And we have his wanderings, chapters 21 through 30. Saul goes from bad to worse, keeps losing battles. Finally, in desperation, he goes to a fortune teller, medium, chapter 28, which was forbidden in Israel, and has her call up the spirit of Samuel. Then said Saul, verse 7, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may inquire of her. Verse 3, Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah even his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. See, Saul had obeyed there. So he has to ask his uh, servants to find him one that's still reading poems and looking at crystal balls that he doesn't know about. So they found him one. He disguised himself and went to her. She calls up the spirit of Samuel, and uh, God permits this to happen because Samuel is going to tell Saul that God is going to destroy him and his sons and take the kingdom completely out of his hands. So it's not a thing that you can prove anything one way or another with. It's, the text is clear enough that Samuel, God permits him to appear. The witch didn't call him up. God permits him to appear. And in her trance, she said, verse 13, I see gods ascending out of the earth. He said, what's the form? She said, it's an old man that's coming up. He's covered with a mantle, the prophet's mantle. Saul perceived it was Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore displeased, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. He doesn't answer me anymore by the prophets or by dreams. And I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I should do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee, and has become your enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake to me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because you obeyed not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. He meant in the grave, of course. The Lord shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Well, that's what happened. Chapter 31 records Saul's death, just like Samuel said it would happen. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, we got through 1 Samuel.